This is the Friday, March 8th, 2019 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now is Elaine Cub. Elaine, welcome back. Good to be here. Elaine, first of all, happy International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day. Oh, <laughs> uh, you mentioned there right at the end of the show, the dollar skyrocketing this week, not having a trickle effect into the grains. Can we expect to see that here within the next week or so? It, the, it, the level or the extremity of the dollar's movement, especially on Thursday and Friday, is, is the sort of thing that typically gets a reaction from commodities. And dollar-denominated commodities should respond bearishly if the price of the nominal dollar goes up. So it, it felt like we should have had more bearishness in the commodity prices on Friday that we didn't see. Like it was a delayed reaction? Uh, that's, what, uh, that's what may happen on Monday, is that it may eventually filter on down. And the reason behind the dollar going up, I suspect, is because of geopolitical uncertainty, perhaps even Brexit. I mean, anything that is making people feel nervous or antsy about uh, the stability of the global economy will send them flooding into the dollar as a safe haven asset. And that is about the only thing I could suggest is, is why the dollar went up. So, so all of that would tend to be a little bit bearish towards commodities. And assuming that we see the dollar remain at these levels or even continue upward, are we going to see exports affected here specifically within the next couple of weeks? Oh, I suppose it depends on the market, right? If we're talking about wheat, where exports are so dismal to begin with, <laughs> I, mean, I don't, I don't know the the, the price. I and guess. I guess soybeans are affected by China. Maybe corn. Is it going to yeah. affect the corn market? <laughs> Pot potentially, sure. Yeah. But not so much wheat and yeah. uh, wheat and soybean. They market. have their own problems. <laughs> they do, regardless of the price. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Elaine, let's take a couple of quick questions here. Brian in Marseille, Illinois, what is going on with these grain markets? Is the bottom near or is there just too much inventory out there? I don't feel like there's too much inventory, and especially if we talk about the corn market as a benchmark. Uh, it's at an 11.8 stocks use ratio. Maybe I guess that probably slightly changed here in today's WASD report, but for it to be too much, you know, that doesn't really exist. As long as it's, as long as there's enough in the system, the industry doesn't start freaking out and, and having a, a sp supply-related price spike. So we're not seeing that happen. There's, there's definitely enough left in inventory. But if there continues to be additional leftover inventory, that doesn't have a linear relationship with prices. We don't expect to see prices go to two dollars just because the stocks use ratio rises to 12 percent or 13 percent. So I think we're okay. When we talk about the corn market story here from the WASD report, I think the ethanol wasn't really a shocker that they reduced uh, the ethanol production. But exports, that really surprised me at least. And I know we were talking about a little before the show today why the sudden decrease in exports. I don't know. Yeah, it does surprise me, especially if you look at the weekly export sales report performances. They've been positive for corn. They've been, you know, quite friendly. So I don't know what justification USDA was using to, to make that reduction in the corn export um, projection. You know, if I was going to be a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> I would say that maybe they were just doing that so that they didn't have to put 200 million bushels less on ethanol. Perhaps they really mm. felt that the ethanol usage would be that bearish, but they just spread it across two different categories to make it look a little less scary. Okay. I doubt they work that way. I don't know. Yeah, who but knows? Who knows? We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's talk a little bit about crop insurance planting decisions coming up here. We had the crop insurance numbers come out last week, was it not? Um, mm -hmm. First of all, share those with our viewers. And secondly, how do you think those are going to impact planting decisions, if at all, this year? Yeah. So um, if you're making an economic decision about what can you really rely on for income, what you what income is backed up by a crop insurance policy is is really part of a farmer's marketing plan so these crop insurance reference price levels they absolutely are part of a decision making processes and those are based on the february the average closes during the month of february so yeah at the end of february we knew what they were it's a four dollar average for corn which is a few cents better than last year and the year before and the average for soybeans was nine dollars and fifty four cents which doesn't sound great but it's not the worst we've seen in recent history in 2016 it was eight nine something so 954 isn't horrible and as a price ratio that soybean to corn price ratio is now 2.38 to 1 based on those crop insurance policy prices so it definitely economically motivates more corn acres and that has been the conventional wisdom all going through the winter is that there would be more corn acres because of these kind of lackluster soybean prices right because of what's going on in China let's say we don't get a deal here for a couple more months. We had a couple people write in, you know, what's the long-term impact? I know that's, we're kind of beating a dead horse there, but we keep getting told 
March, and then yeah. now we find out eh, it's probably not going to happen another meeting here at the end of March. What are prices going to look like here in a couple of months? Let's say midsummer if we don't have those worked out. Well, let's say that it did get normalized and we had a fairly normal trading pattern in the 2019-2020 marketing year. That's fine. You still have 900 million bushels mm -hmm. left over from this past marketing year that didn't get bought and didn't get shipped. So there will probably be l these large inventory that just has to slowly get blended off over the next two or three years. Some of that could become a quality problem even. Um, so the implications for the market will be particularly noticeable in basis and particularly in the Western Corn Belt versus the Eastern Corn Belt where there is more domestic uh, crushing. And that's been quite positive, actually. The crush, crush margins this week and this month have, have been And I think good. they increased crush on today's report. Yeah, just, justifiably, little bit, justifiably, because the economics are there. But if in the Western Corn Belt where these soybeans are sitting there and they're not going by rail to the PNW yet because we just haven't, got that business that just never appeared there at the end of 2018, you know, it could be years before that disappears. And if you want like really long-term implications, I guess we either need to grow fewer soybean acres long-term, find something else to grow, or really boost more domestic production or more domestic you, use. Yeah, yeah. Or, or find new export markets, potentially. Potentially. So I hate to even bring this up because Obviously, we all want to see something get done with China. Obviously, other growers watching want to see something get done with China. But let's say long term, we don't. I'm just going to say, you know, I mean, there's been rumors or conspiracy conspiracy theories that we're going to wait until the next presidential election before oh. we see China really come to the table. They're just going to punt it off for political reasons. OK, let's say that that happens. Totally talking in hypotheticals here. Let's say it happens. We wait another two years. We don't see normal exports to China. We don't see any any new or expanding markets. I'm talking mm -hmm. total worst case scenario here. What do we see those ending stocks get up to if we're almost at a billion now? Yeah, it could certainly go above a billion. Um, and folks can store it. it. Just like you mentioned, just get blended off slowly. But, uh, and I don't know that it is such a hypothetical that you're talking about. I think even in the, the best case, the best headlines that we see about the trade suggested that they weren't, weren't going to have one big final document mm -hmm. that everybody signs and everybody's happy again. It was going to be an ongoing process. They're going to meet every six months and renegotiate things and renegotiate things. So I think absolutely this is something we're going to be dealing with for the next two years. You don't think that that's such a hypothetical? I don't think it's I don't think it's a hypothetical at all. I think that's the stated intention. So let me ask you this, and this is probably not going to be exciting for a lot of viewers, but do you expect us to see trading ranges continue to be at these levels if we're still dealing with the Chinese trade stuff? Oh yes, yes. I think 950 soybeans is not a terrible. I mean, given the the scenarios we could envision for the next 12, 24 months. 950 soybeans is underpriced compared to corn. We talked about that ratio, but it may not be underpriced compared to the future disasters that could be down the line. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the good here. We've got we've got the bad scenario out of the way. Let's talk about the good. Let's say we do see a trade deal here within the next couple of months. Who's got the best chance to jump into the field and take advantage of that potential market again? Do you mean like versus the U.S. or Brazil? Uh, sorry, in the U.S. Oh. Who's got the best chance to jump into the field and, and take the lion's share maybe or take advantage of that newfound trade deal? Oh, wh which market? Which state? I'm sorry. Oh, which state? Well, I mean, the, the, the benefit has, has always been here in the eastern Corn Belt where they can ship the soybeans by barge down to the Gulf. That can go in any direction or the domestic processing industry there. I feel like... Ugh, us poor farmers in the Western Corn Belt, let's say anybody west of I-29 where those soybeans typically go by rail to the PNW, it is really ugly. You've still got basis prices there at 150 under, 170 under, mm. anywhere, Western Nebraska, Western Kansas, any of that rail market is, is sort of stuck. 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 Okay. Elaine, we've got a good question here. It's talking about seasonality of prices. Phil in Dresden, Ontario, he's been watching you. He said December corn currently at 387. You called it in 2016 on June 18th. He's got the exact date for you. Last year about May 29th in 2017, early July. When can we expect Dees corn to top out this year? Well, this is, yeah, this is a piece of analysis I've done that um, if you have a, a year of normal supply, normal inventories in the corn market, the date 
of the year when you have the highest probability of seeing the new crop corn market hit its one annual high. So the highest date mm -hmm. of the year, the most likely date is June 18th, or it has been over the past 18 years of data. So that's fine, but I think what Phil's asking here is, is if I anticipate that to be the case in 2019. I don't know. I think in 2019 we might see the high come a little earlier because I feel like there's going to be a lot of corn acres because nobody wants to plant these lackluster soybean prices. So we might be seeing the highs now. We might have already seen that high, you know, at 402 or whatever. It might That might have been it, and it might just dwindle all the way towards harvest. Are there any signals either technically or fundamentally that indicate to us that that is the high? No, I mean, just a, just an expectation of, of what the inventories are going to look like as you go forward. And that June 18th is sort of a reflection of when is their weather risk premium put into the market, and it's when the corn crop is at the most risk. But if we have a scenario of just many, many acres, 92 million acres, even larger corn acres, which is still a possibility, despite the snow that's on the ground now, I think it's still a possibility that folks will be able to plant as many corn acres as, they've, as they want to logistically. It will be a possibility. Then that means there will just be a steady drip of bearish news through the year 2019 because you'd have the drip of mm -hmm. bearish acreage news and then almost certainly pretty good yields this year. We're not looking at any drought scenarios here at the start. So I think just a, a drip of bearish news throughout the growing season. All right, Alinka, maybe not the happiest note to end on, but thank Sorry. you so much for your analysis. Well, it's always a pleasure. Join us again next week when we visit a family making the move from the city to the country in the name of keeping the family farm operational. And Don Rose will sit across from me at the market to market table. Until then, thanks for watching, listening or reading. I'm Delaney Howell. Have a great week.